Welcome to your Drive Time News Blast. 30 minutes of jam-packed, up-to-the-minute news from a perspective of truth, liberty, and justice every weekday. This is Monica Perez. And I'm Brad Binkley. Happy Constitution Day. It's my favorite day. (laughs) Right on. I'm going to say that's my influence that gets you there. Well, I am going to highlight today a Ver- my one of my favorite amendments to the Constitution, one that I think that we should take very seriously, maybe even my only exception to strict libertarianism under all circumstances, is maybe we shouldn't be allowed to waive our Sixth Amendment rights because we are forced to live under a pathocracy, a pathocracy, a government that works against our interests. Here it is. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense." I feel that Bill Cosby was deprived of that right, and I think they're working on Lori Loughlin and a couple of different angles for that one. And I noticed today another woman was arrested, arrested in Spain. They called her a Canadian woman. She has a Chinese name, so I'm thinking she was an immigrant, and I only even thought that was relevant because she's accused of giving $400,000 to Rick Singer to get her child into school. So as I was reading through this article, and that just seems like Canadian, not a Canadian, it does not a classic Canadian thing to do to not believe in their own education system. They're very proud of that. Mm -hmm. And they're like, don't have money growing on trees. So this Canadian chick, um, she was arrested in Spain. They're thinking about extraditing her. But as I read through the story, I learned things that I hadn't known before or hadn't realized is that not not even half of the people, the parents who were charged have uh, plea bargained, not even half of them. And actually, people who are in cumulative total accused of up to $8 million in bribes or what would be categorized as bribes to Rick Singer weren't even charged because, at, like in the case of two two. Singer clients paid millions to get their children into Yale and Stanford, and they were not charged at all because they said they didn't know the money was being used for bribes. So that's what I think is the case for Lori Loughlin. And lest people not realize, I think she's being persecuted for her political and religious views. I think that's what what made her on one side of the line and not the other. And I can't tell you how many people are tweeting at me that she's guilty. It makes me nutso. I agree. I think she's being set up. I saw a story today that said that Lori Loughlin may reconsider pleading guilty after seeing what happened to Huffman, and I hope that's not true. I saw those articles, and I think those are intimidation tactics, Mm -hmm. and she has a great lawyer, and that is why the courts are working to get her to not have the defense of that counsel, a violation of the Sixth Amendment, and they want to pressure her into plea bargaining so they increased the charges against her again sixth amendment violation in my opinion not a fair and speedy trial they're they're trying to deprive her of the right to a fair and speedy trial yeah the intimidation thing is for real too there's other articles that are talking about how outrageous it is that huffman only got 14 days and how it's a sign of her white privilege and i think this is all part of well Lori lachlan's really going to have it coming down on her Right, and that maybe will give them an excuse because they had to give Huffman something, but they also had to reward her for cooperating. And that, speaking of intimidation, the Brett Kavanaugh story is about, uh, I noticed this, I was listening to Rush today. I'm going to give him props because sometimes when you come to a conclusion, even before the other person says it, they've really led you to that conclusion, although he's playing into the hands of, the dialectic, I guess. I guess I'm overusing that, but into the hands of the psyop that's being played around Kavanaugh, and I think it's the purpose. So what one of the things he said is the reason the left is going so hard against Kavanaugh, and I know you know that firsthand. I want to hear Binkley how what you what's how you know exactly that he's such a target. But what Rush was saying 
was that they are using it to for any of a variety of reasons to discredit his rulings, to get him thrown out, to intimidate other conservative justices from uh, accepting Trump's nomination. Now, Kavanaugh is not a conservative justice. He was a Clinton shill. But so the last thing Rush said was maybe they're trying to intimidate him into not making good calls in his cases. And I had already thought that maybe they're, this is all big, uh, they're constructing a legacy for this guy to be the most disappointing for conservatives judges judges of all time. Like he's the Trojan horse. He's the Manchurian t- candidate. The way John Roberts, a Republican appointee, gave us Obamacare because he was the deciding vote. If Kavanaugh does stuff like that, and there's no reason to think he isn't going to do what he's told, that's the way he seems to have operated in the past. If he does stuff like that, Rush or whomever might say, oh, well, what can you expect? That guy has PTSD. He's not. He's been through enough. He cares about his family. He had to capitulate. What a disappointment, but who can blame him after what he's been through? He's siding with liberal judges in his decisions already. He's been— oh, well, I, I anticipated that, yeah. but I think that because of his history. Yeah. And that's why—and that is that was the origin. We talked about it. That was the origin of when— when this was all coming down, I was like, they're actually trying to distract the right into defending him as a knee-jerk reaction. Exactly. When, in fact, he's not conservative enough, they should be rejecting him on that ground. It was their reverse psychology way of getting him in there. Yeah, this story, Maybe. the fact that it's still in the news, is serving its purpose perfectly. The story has become about the New York Times omitting perhaps the most vital information in their story about the new victim that came out, actually not considering herself a victim, not being the source of the claim, and claiming to not even (laughs) ever remember being at that party. So the central theme of the article was the most important part was left out by the New York Times because it was in a book. And so the the left-wing media and the right-wing media both get something to pull on here. The left keeps saying, well, it was just an accident. Well, actually, the author said that she crafted the tweet that was misleading. Did you see that? I did. I did see that. It was in the book, so it was a tease. You have right, to buy right. the book to get the right, real— to get the actual the, truth. Yeah. So we're going to lie to you, which e- yes. is false advertising. Even though it's reported as though it's breaking news, it's, it will completely transform the meaning of the story when you go buy the book. How many books do you think they're going to sell? Probably not many now. That well, oh, actually, they, I think they'll sell a ton. Off of outrage. You're right. They'll yeah. sell, make a lot of outrage. So it's and, probably and number to one support. already. It's the virtue thing. They're yeah, so do it to support the media is already downplaying that, and that is something because what they did is extraordinary and clearly on purpose to mislead the public. The right wing gets to say, well, Trump's being victimized by the media again. So what this does is this story, just like Kavanaugh, it benefited both sides last time. It benefits both both sides this time is they both get rich off of it. They both get to fundraise to their people. They both get to organize. They both get to recruit. And I got two emails yesterday right on the heels of the story, not to mention that Kavanaugh, impeach Kavanaugh was the top trend on Twitter for most of the day yesterday. Everybody knows they're not going to impeach Kavanaugh. They're not impeaching Kavanaugh. So here's what the email says. Women's March. It's from the Women's March. The headline, Kavanaugh lied. Kavanaugh lied, and we knew it all along. His accusers knew it. Women across the country knew it. The Senate knew it. We all knew he was lying, but we confirmed him anyway. He's unfit to serve in the Supreme Court. Donate $10 monthly to help us reclaim the court and stop our assault on democracy. And then it lists uh, about the event that they must come to. Women's March demand justice on October 6th to protest Kavanaugh in Washington, D.C. And then I got another one from Indivisible laying out a similar story, asking people if they're prepared to fight against Kavanaugh because another accuser has come forward. So they are right on top of fundraising and mobilizing around this issue. Yeah, I agree. It's never going to happen, but it's all about the money. And it's funny because uh, speaking of being all about the money, Trump said a tweet, I think it was yesterday or whatever, about the Obama book deals. The Obama book deals, like it's all, what what's up with that? And I don't know if I think I brought it. I think I've told you about this before. Like, I, I know we've talked about it personally, but on the air that that. I always scratched my head over how much money Obama made while he was in office on that biography because, like, how many books could you sell? 
It was really screwy. So when it happened in Baltimore and you were like, oh, that chick really got in trouble because the book was the way to give them payola. So when I was looking at the Michelle Obama deal where she got like $48 million or six, some like double digit, high double digit millions of dollars, I just did the math on how you could possibly sell that many books and and you just couldn't. Like the the book, book writer, the author usually gets 10% or something. How could it ever happen? And then I realized that she sells out arenas. She's on a tour. So if she was getting this money from the publisher and the publisher was was including in the advance money for her appearances, that could easily cover. So Trump actually picked the one a circumstance his obama's original biography if you're looking through his first term and how much money he made or the second term i would say that might not stand up to scrutiny but the thing that trump is talking about the netflix documentary and my takeaway is that the image the persona that michelle obama is peddling is a complete creation i mean it's not that she's a created person it's like this is a person that lives outside of her and and that thing though is selling. So I feel like this is going to fly in the that this is going to backfire on Trump, even though his fundamental premise is correct. In the Netflix aspect of that, we mentioned this briefly when it first happened. The Obamas signed like a multi million, it was like fifty million dollar deal with Netflix to produce content that shapes the culture. That's basically how it was introduced as. So I don't know what legalities are there, but. It's definitely a propaganda outlet for the Obamas, and this is marketing for Obama's first produced film that's coming. It's either come out recently or it's coming out soon. So Trump's tweet markets for Obama. Oh, nice, nice. And and, and the media and our tax money funding the CIA, all of this stuff is part of the – and like tax-exempt foundations. They're all part of this clever system where our tax dollars pay for our own surveillance, for our own brainwashing. We pay for it. They have their their tax deductions for or it's tax free money doubles the the power of that money when and they use it to manipulate us as we as we hear. But and then what was the the Abrams thing? The Abr she's getting some uh big media play. Was she not didn't she have some Big feature was at HBO. What was she on? Stacey Abrams just partnered with Pod Save America, the Obama bros that were there, the speechwriters for Obama that after he got out of office, they were given a podcast, well-funded. They have a show on HBO. They tour around the country. Their target audience are people who are like 16 years old. They're some of the baseline standard setters for spreading the progressive talking points. So they partnered with Stacey Abrams to push Fair Fight 2020, which she's going across the country training people on how to fight against voter suppression, which me and you both know that what that means is create voter suppression, make sure (laughs) voter suppression happens so that it can then be blamed. Or that other votes are more highly weighted or it's not it's not even voter suppression. It's more like if they're going to go to your house and have you vote right there while they're giving you the cigarettes, you know, like that was the old gore thing. Like they would pick up homeless people and promise them cigarettes if they would go vote. Yeah. I mean, it's like that. If Stacey Abrams shows up at your house with a ballot and you can register and vote right then and there. And she has the kind of Victoria Newland uh, my Don cookies with her. Yeah. You're going to vote the way she tells you that she'll probably have the things already filled out. Exactly. And an important thing to remember about this, she is furthering these talking points deeper and deeper into every corner of the country. Now, definitely with young people because of the Pod Save America thing. And it's important to remember that voter suppression has to occur for any of this to matter. There's no chance that voter suppression does not occur. Otherwise, millions upon millions of donated dollars from George Soros and others are wasted. Which may explain why Abrams didn't actually go after the only person where there's pretty damning evidence against it was her opponent, Brian Kemp. There are lawsuits filed against him for how deliberately shady and illegal the 2016 election was on his watch as Secretary of State in Georgia. And she never even mentioned that yeah. in her campaign against him. And that's her particular issue. So yeah. clearly they want the issue to be alive. Yeah, it's just she like, might have won if she had talked about that. Right. 
It's just like Kavanaugh. They could have attacked him for the things that were bad about for, him. For covering up the Vince Foster. I'm going to say it's a murder because that's what Miguel Rodriguez, whose predecessor said that it, the evidence did not support a finding a suicide and the guy's dead and it wasn't natural causes. Yeah. You know why he's not going to get impeached for the same reason Trump's not going to get impeached for the same reason Trump's going to win. He's a lightning rod for division that both sides can get rich off of whenever they strike it. For sure. So speaking of the young people, uh, they is that are, is the climate strike coming up? Is that about young people? You tweet. I think you tweeted something. This about is an that. extraordinary story. There is 800 climate protests around the country going on on September 20th and in countries across the world this is going this is a global climate strike headed up by the United Nations and the largest school district in the country in New York City just declared yesterday that 1.1 million students in the city can skip for the climate change protest and they will not be penalized for going to what's called the Global Climate Youth Strike, which is on September 20th, three days before the U.N. Global Climate Summit is going to be held in New York City. They're going to protest outside the U.N. This to me is very curious for a couple of reasons. One, I wonder what's going to happen to the students who decide not to skip school that day. I bet they're called climate deniers. I bet they might even get in trouble because if you're a climate denier, you're clearly – you have mental health problems. So and you don't believe in science, so you're probably an anti-vaxxer. Yeah, so you're probably going to be shipped off to a mental asylum if you <laughs> go to school that day. Or quarantine. They said that most of the yeah, – exactly. Most of the teachers were planning on going to the climate strike anyway. So if some kid decides to go to school, oh, yeah. the teacher's going right. to see him as a smart-ass climate denier who's right. preventing me from go- – So right. I think this is – this isn't – granting people permission right. students permission this is a un directed global mandate that you have to skip school and go to the cli- go to the climate strike and the precedent for that was the parkland gun thing where my son who has down syndrome and a one-on-one aide and i am a gun rights activist went and marched against gun rights at school supposedly spontaneously yeah. I mean, clearly, there's nothing. It, there was nothing volitional about that. No, not at all. And they're doing so many insidious things with this story. This Greta Thornburg character, you talked about her recently. She has become a global superstar, the equivalent of a pop star like Miley Cyrus, two children. Children nine years old are showing up to protest to see her. So they want them to model after this pop star-like figure. And they have pressure groups of students going around to other students, pressuring them to join in the climate protest. I mean, this is tyranny. Yeah, and her language is quite terroristic. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it, it's really moralizing approach that makes you feel ashamed i mean it really reminds me of my daughter saying i don't want to know the truth because people will hate me (laughs) yeah miley gets them to dance she gets them to protest so uh what is the so that's the climate strike but the strike is in the air right now i noticed that your the the strikes that you alerted us to a couple of weeks ago are still i mean the number one story on the wall street journal the big picture above the fold is the uaw strike yeah, one of the largest in 12 – or the first nationwide strike in 12 years and is part of what Vox is calling a global trend of large-scale strikes against against labor union strikes. And we see Bernie Sanders and them pushing the talking points about this. But this protest is – they're going to link it into the economy. They're going to say they're not benefiting from Trump's economy, and they're also targeting the gig economy because they don't want people to be able to come in and, and get jobs without being subjected to unions' rules. Well, the gig economy, I always thought, was a bit of a trap that the the fact that apps get you the gig work, Uber uh, draws people in, uh, Bitcoin feels very libertarian. But in the end, every single thing you do gets digitized that way. And even with Uber, when I first saw a couple of years ago the ruling come down from California that Uber drivers would be considered employees, I thought – of all the benefits, political benefits Uber has gotten to crush taxis that for decades could not be touched from a political point of view, why would the winds change all of a sudden? And then I realized that the whole point of Uber, which is not profitable and will not be profitable, 
I believe, until it goes driverless, was to get Uber in there, but not the drivers. So the gig economy, <laughs> yeah. the labor has always just been a trap, like Bitcoin is a trap. I mean, I shouldn't say it. People really defend Bitcoin, and maybe it will be undetectable, like they say, but I just I can't help but think that we're getting sucked into cyber world forever. But here's the thing about the labor strikes is that the Democrats abandoned labor. They kind of openly said that, I think, in the 2012 campaign of Obama. There was like a leaked memo. Haha. And and when they advocate for free trade, kind of, you know, against Trump stuff or this uh, unfettered, unskilled immigration, that is just not a traditional position in support of labor. So I don't understand how... Uh, I, I, you know, it's, I can't believe labor's falling for it. They got the talking points, equality, health care. Well, that's the thing with the UAW. They have health care. They have great wages. They seem to be saying we're doing this for everybody. Yeah. And that was a little bit of what they actually said, but that, so this to me, I wonder what percentage of, I mean, maybe the strikers like it because maybe there's a thing in their contract that they get paid anyway, so they'll go along with it, but that doesn't mean these people who I'm looking at right now with those signs actually work for the UAW. There's a they might not. That. And my mother always said, that's a like, good you'd point. see picketers, and she'd say, they're, they're, I, I would say, oh, that's nice. They're just like, those people are getting paid. Yeah, these are professional yeah. resistors that are joining all these causes and pulling people in. Yeah. Uh, I noticed this. Well, first, I want just before I, we get, when, before I go to the international news this there's one very local story these three teens a 15 year old a 16 year old and another 16 year old were shot they had masks on they approached a house where was on the property of a house uh where the people homeowners and you know people lived in the house were on the lawn this was in uh rockdale and the kids were from conyers so they approached those people, they wanted to rob them, and one of the teens in the masks brandished a weapon and fired it. So one of the guys who was standing on the lawn, the homeowner, I guess had his own weapon handy, even though they say it's like a, a peaceful neighborhood, and he shot them all dead. Shot them all dead. And it would have been clear-cut, no problem, but one of them was running away, and they're like, oh, this may be a stand your ground thing. But once they started shooting, I think there's absolutely no chance this guy. I, I mean, that would be justifiable. They were shooting. I mean, who and he shot one of the guys right on his property. What if the guys, the other kid is going to come around and and snipe him from behind, which he absolutely might have. But you can't help but wonder if this I, I, I did wonder if this was going to turn into a, a racial issue because it seemed. It seems like the two of the victims were victims and perpetrators. The, per the victims of gunshot wounds, the perpetrators of the crime, Isaiah Reed and Jaime Hernandez. I don't know what race they are, but I'm guessing black and Hispanic. But their race and the homeowner's race has not been brought up at all, even though race is always brought up when it feeds into the narrative of aggressive white, gun rights activists, you know, there was a bunch of stories like that, like the kids who almost like, almost like stories that deliberately demonstrated the Bill Cosby pound cake thing where like there was a kid stealing a beer or soda or a donut. These were two stories recently where they were shot. And the argument is that's ridiculous to shoot somebody for stealing a donut and that it was portrayed as racist. So this is not, there's no race in Bill it. Bill Cosby assume, pound cake. Bill Cosby like he became persona non grata when he said, look, you are responsible for raising your kids right. And when they get in trouble or they get shot or something like that uh, for stealing a pound cake from the grocery store, what he's got the pound cake in his hand. Why does he have the pound cake in his hand? Just make sure he never steals the pound cake and you don't have to worry about the kid coming home at night. So it was called the pound cake speech. Okay. And it was after that that he needed to be discredited thoroughly. And uh, and I'm just saying, so then there were a couple, this was a long time ago, but there were a couple of incidents recently that almost demonstrated how ridiculous it is to shoot somebody over a pound cake. 
And if this were that case, you'd be hearing about it, I think. So uh, I think this will have the gun rights element to it, but not a racial element. But uh, so on to international stuff. One thing is there was a Canadian spy, supposedly a guy named Cameron Ortiz, Ortiz, O-R-T-I-S, who was an intelligence director in Canada, and he speaks Chinese. He was involved somehow in the Magnitsky case, which I'm not going to get into now. We don't have time. But Magnitsky, there's a Magnitsky Act. I wrote quite a bit about it, actually, last night on thepropreport.com in deep dives, and I tweeted it also at Monica Perez Show. Is it but the this, violation of it the reason for the sanctions on Russia? I don't know. I mean, I if you want to get into it, the Magnitsky Act was a 2012 act. This guy, Bill Browder, I think his name was, was a hedge fund guy. His, they say it was his lawyer was beaten to death in prison. That's Magnitsky. But the alternative story is that Magnitsky was his accountant and he had, was diabetic and he died in prison. And... And so he's dead. And Bill Browder, who was considered to be a fraudster, was uh, and a tax evader in Russia, is wanted for questioning in Russia. And as a matter of fact, when Putin and Trump had a press conference, they about uh, wanting to we us wanting to interrogate one of their guys. Remember what what was it? I can't remember what our guy was, but. Putin said, so, yeah. hey, you have – we want to interrogate Browder. There are rules for this, and you're not complying. So – but he didn't say Browder, but that's who he was talking about. So the Magnitsky Act is is something about the right to – you know, imp- I think it's imposed – I don't really know what the – I didn't look into the Magnitsky Act, but I know people know that name because it generated a law. But I believe that Magnitsky himself was not – wasn't the victim that he was portrayed as. What What is the Magnitsky Act? It is the source of the sanctions for Russia. The Magnitsky Act is a bill that is intended to punish Russian officials who were responsible for the death of Magnitsky. Okay. So that guy supposedly wasn't even killed by them or whatever, but this guy, Ortiz, had some connection with that case. So you could look at this. I mean, the fact that that was even written anywhere means that he's either considered a Russian spy or a Chinese spy uh, because he speaks Chinese. But the one thing that came up repeatedly in every article I read about this guy is uh, that Canada is part of the Five Eyes Network. And therefore, we we have an interest in what in his ability to control intel And his reliability there. The five eyes are, I think, Australia, New Zealand, U.S., U.K., and maybe South Africa. Basically, the English island ring around, you know, the the big Earth continent. New Zealand. You say New Zealand. I said New Zealand. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So, uh, but but here's the thing. So this is an idea. Like we have an interest in this Canadian guy because we are affected by them. And then I saw today that Russia had a fire in a lab that holds smallpox and Ebola. There's only two samples of smallpox left in the world, supposedly. And that they had a fire in one of them that contains that. Now, they don't think it got out. don't think it affected the area. But that kind of a story seems like we wouldn't even know that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't even know how we would know that or it would get press. Yeah. But it really goes to this what if you read the report from Iron Mountain, you might remember that they look for and need gl- reasons to be globally, you know, to have global government. That you need things that would affect us. That so you can't trust Russia as a government because they might let that out. So maybe Trump will say, you know, if they can't handle that, then maybe we should forcibly take over their medical facilities, or you can't. You can't rely. So it's all this idea of like it's a connected world and you can't really have sovereignty or trust other people. And I I feel that way about the way like Pence said something about Saudi Arabia today, which was that uh, we are locked and loaded to protect the interests of our allies. And I just have to say this is a very important principle that a government does not have the right 
to make an alliance that is not mutually beneficial. So JFK could not have had a mutual defense pact with the Vatican because there's no chance the Vatican could ever help us. So it would give us an obligation without giving us a reward. Or like Turkey. We're in NATO with Turkey. So an attack on Turkey is an attack on us all, and then we would have to defend them. But Turkey is provocative sometimes. So you're ensuring their behavior, but you can't control their behavior, yet they can control their behavior. So we're really not permitted to expose ourselves to the bad actions. And Saudi Arabia is bombing one of the poorest countries in the world for just personal, re- you know, for reasons of their own interest without any justification whatsoever. And we are, you know, if, if that victim of their attack is retaliating or gets an alliance to help retaliate an ally, it is, it is not justifiable for us to commit, for our government to unilaterally commit U.S. tax dollars and soldiers to defending a country that could never help us. Saudi Arabia is not, as a matter of fact, look at 9-11. Even if it was exactly what it was told, rogue terrorists, our involvement in the Middle East makes us vulnerable without really giving us any advantage. I mean, we, have, we are energy independent, and we could always have been or move on from oil dependence. We have no right to the resources that are under the ground of some other people. So there's just – it's I've, not justifiable. I have two quick – speaking of justifiable, I have two quick thoughts on that. I was looking at Wikipedia yesterday at international crisis, and I'd never looked at this on Wikipedia before. The first type of international crisis, the three types of a situation that arises, it says justification of hostilities. One of the nations decides before the crisis starts to go to war and constructs a crisis to justify it. The pattern of justification is almost always the same. Rouse public opinion, make impossible demands, try to legitimize the demands, deny your real intentions, then employ the rejection of the demands as a reason for war. What was the first sentence? What was this that you're explaining? This is one of the reasons given for international crisis on Wikipedia. The justification of hostilities. One nation decides before the crisis. Right, okay, okay. So it's just – it's describing a false flag right there on Wikipedia in other terms. I thought that was kind of interesting and relevant right now related to protest and related to Iran. And I think a what to watch out for for Iran is – we talked about this before – Operation Nitro Zeus, which is basically – A kill switch that we have built into the Iranian power grid that we can use to cyber attack them at any time. And actually, you would have to because I do not think they're going out of their way to create hostility against themselves. I don't think they want that. They just they're not prepared to take on the entire world. So if you did something like that to them, that would force them to act. That would be the tripwire. Yeah, that, that people will use. So I wanted to, before we wrap it up, say uh, it is the first, but not the last, Share the Show Tuesday. All right. Yes. We ask, I'm not going to ask every day to do it. You can do it every day if you want. But we really want to spread the word. Every, it seems like every time we get like a new tranche of listeners, they just stick with us and it's very addicting. So all we need is for you to share the show, kind of make it feel like we're doing something right uh, on all of your social media platforms and also pick one person who you know who likes to stay informed or who gave up on staying informed because he or she hates the mainstream media BS. So figure out the person who will love this show. Share it with them, please. And uh, also or give us any feedback you want. You can go to thepropreport.com and communicate with me there. I'm there every day, and it's uh, been really fun and interesting, and I appreciate the links that people put up there. Great. Share the show Tuesday. I feel like we need a a jingle for that at some point. You guys can find your Drive Time News Blast every weekday afternoon at 4 p.m. on thepropreport.com or your favorite podcasting platform with the Propaganda Report feed. We will talk to you all tomorrow.